the part of the brain that gets hijacked by anything that can spike dopamine levels too high is the limbic system, a very primitive, all or nothing, fight or flight part of the brain. And when it gets hijacked, it will defend and seek that which it thinks it needs to survive vehemently. If you haven't eaten food for 12 hours, you have tunnel vision, your dopamine plummets, you're moody, you will push over small children to get to food. There's a saying, the world is three meals away from utter chaos. It's the same thing that happens when we become addicted to anything, whether that be a substance or behavior. We will say and do anything to defend our need for it. Not to mention, once that part of the brain becomes hijacked, it sends a signal to our prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that gets attached to things that are good for our survival, like people, places, and things that care for us and nourish us. But when the limbic system gets hijacked by something that increases dopamine levels too high, it sends a signal to the prefrontal cortex that says, ooh, this is really good for your survival, so you should attach to it. So when I hear people vehemently defending their need for cannabis or the reasons that they use it, whether it be medicinal or for pain or any other I always think about how hijacked their limbic system is and how that reward pathway has sent a signal to their prefrontal cortex that will come up with all kinds of rational and irrational reasons to defend their need for it. There is a state of mind called hypofrontality. Hypofrontality is caused when the frontal lobe downregulates, meaning it moves the electrical activity and blood flow into the limbic system. When somebody is high or intoxicated or scared, the brain mobilizes to either get what the, it thinks it needs to survive or to uh, downregulate and um, react out of fear. So when people are using intoxicants or engaging in a behavior that spikes dopamine levels too high, Limbic system lights up, the frontal lobe downregulates, almost turning off. The frontal lobe is the part of the brain that has emotion regulation, impulse control, the ability to feel empathy and use abstract rational reasoning. So when somebody is using a substance, especially every day or every other day, their frontal lobe is always downregulated in some shape or form, which means they don't have the kind of normal access to their executive functioning skills that they should have. That means they're going to respond in very immature, selfish, self-centered, self-focusing ways, which is one of the reasons why family members feel so disconnected and don't understand what's going on. It's not their family member. It's literally just a, an addictive limbic system that is rationalizing and moving toward finding that thing that it thinks it needs to survive, whether that be a drug or a behavior. I was a very uh, rule-following, anxious, wanting-to-make-all-A kind of kid until family moved and my parents got divorced and I really wanted to fit in. And so this really cute boy tells me to go to a party and somebody handed me a beer. What I didn't know when I drank that beer is that I have a genetic predisposition that predisposes me to becoming addicted to anything that spikes my dopamine levels. And unfortunately, the beer did. So I kept moving when I was a kid because of all our family dysfunction. And I, I took summer school classes to get to know other kids who take summer school classes, usually the kids who are making poor decisions. So I met a lot of great kids who were making some pretty poor decisions and hung out with them and used a lot of the substances that they did. And I really wanted to fit in. And then I wanted to take away my negative feelings. And unfortunately, drugs and alcohol are great for doing that until you get addicted and they're the cause of the negative feelings.
So I had an overdose when I was 18 And I picked up the phone, the thousand pound phone, and I called my mom who helped me get into rehab. When I graduated from rehab, I went to a halfway house for about six months and I got stable. And that's when I went back to college and I started studying everything I could get my hands on about the brain and addiction. And it was a really cool period of time to study because all of these really cool functional MRI studies were being published. And now I do that as a hobby. I constantly look at fMRI studies. And what I'm seeing is that there are a variety of different high-risk behavior that cause hypofrontality. And when your frontal lobe is shut off more than it's on, it creates what doctors call a state of acquired narcissism. The key word is acquired. When you don't have the part of the brain on that can have empathy problem solve, make good decisions, use abstract reasoning, then you're really self-focused, have difficulty regulating emotion. And so you end up looking like a very self-absorbed, self-centered human that has difficulty attuning to others. Uh, You know, that's when people might call you a a, a dumb stoner or, um, you know, a selfish, self-centered jerk. But the truth is, Without the drugs and alcohol and your frontal lobe turning on, which is the part of the brain that actually attunes to others, can calm yourself down, can delay gratification. When that part of the brain is on, you're not narcissistic. You're other focused. You have the ability to stay in your adult energy and have good relationships. Those are unfortunately delayed or... um, disabled when we're using. That part of the brain is just not as accessible to us. When you look at the brain and the central nervous system, specifically we focus in on dopamine because every chemical of abuse out there has in common an increase in dopamine. That's what changes the brain chemistry and hijacks a brain, specifically the limbic system that gets addicted But every drug also does something else to the brain or body. For instance, alcohol increases GABA, which is our brain's neurotransmitter that calms us down. That's why alcohol can calm us down. Also makes us feel really good. GABA plus dopamine. Serotonin is another neurotransmitter that our body helps us to regulate our feelings and make us feel more uh, calm. Now, cocaine increases serotonin and dopamine, central nervous system stimulant. So we feel really, really good because of the combination of those two. If you look at any chemical out there, marijuana is another example. It increases dopamine, but it also binds to endocannabinoid receptor sites. We have those all over our brain and body, especially in our gut, and they also increase things like GABA. So they are a replacement central nervous system depressant. So of course, you can probably stop alcohol if you try using Kush or any other synthetic substance that binds to the same receptor sites. But you're not actually solving the problem. You're just switching from one addiction to the other. And that's what things like harm reduction are. When somebody's addicted to fentanyl or um, heroin, of course, reducing harm to methadone is very helpful because then you don't have the dangerous and debilitating withdrawal symptoms. But now you're hooked on methadone or suboxone for potentially decades, unless you go through the same withdrawal process to get off of them, which many don't because it's so painful. It's been an interesting journey. The first half of my 26 year career thus far was a lot of alcohol and drug issues. The average age was about 15, 16 years old of my clients. Today, what I'm seeing average age is about 12, 13, 14, and it's a combination of addictive technology, addictive video games. Some of it is early nicotine or alcohol use or marijuana use, but uh, it's more of a combination today. 
And what I'm also seeing is that the incidence and frequency and intensity of cannabis addiction are skyrocketing. Back in uh, the year I was born, 1970, the average amount of THC in marijuana is about 2%. Today, we're seeing anywhere between 56% and 99%. So the rate at which people are becoming addicted is skyrocketing, skyrocketing in proportion to how much THC is synthesized or grown into the plant. So where it used to take maybe two to three years to start becoming or showing signs of cannabis addiction. Now it's happening within three to four months. And a percentage of people who used marijuana back in 1970 would have a psychotic episode based upon that. But the percentage was about 2%. 2% of all people who tried weed would have a psychotic episode. Now today we're seeing that go up to in the 20 to 25th percentile because there's so much more THC. It's just much more potent. So we're seeing more and more people having psychosis. But it's not just what I saw in the 70s or not 70s, but 80s when I was a teenager. You know, it used to be you might have a psychotic episode, go into the hospital for an overnight stay, come out and you're fine. Your brain was able to heal and adjust. And today we're not seeing that. I'm seeing people go into mental hospitals forever changed. I'm seeing parents who are having to figure out how to institutionalize their college age adult children because they can't function in society anymore. I'm seeing kids who are so sick from hyperemesis that they can't eat and keep weight on. I'm seeing people who have chronic pain or chronic anxiety use marijuana to treat those illnesses, but end up with four to five times the amount of chronic pain and not only increased anxiety, but now also psychosis and paranoia that comes with that. Medicine in the term of cannabis is not a real term. It's a marketing term. And the idea is addiction for profit. Our industries don't care what's happening to the brains of their clients. They just want to line their pockets with as much cash as they possibly can, regardless of the public health crisis. And what I'm starting to see is more and more people are starting to know someone that has this issue. Right, The percentage of people who used to become addicted to marijuana back in the 70s was about 9%. Today, we're in the 20th to 25th percentile of the rates of addiction. We're also seeing a large percentage of the population who are not using recreationally just for fun. They're getting hooked on it and they're getting hooked quickly. So now they're using on a much more consistent, regular basis, suffering consequences, but are not able to stop. So that's what I'm seeing now in clinical practice. And when I watch the states who are legalizing it, we know that the reason they are is because lobbyists are sharing with politicians very cherry-picked studies on how these things can help or medicate when in actuality, the totality of the research on cannabis, and please know, I have read every journal article that I can get my hands on from when they started publishing it, but the totality of this research shows that it not only um, does not work well for treating things like anxiety, depression, or chronic pain, but it exacerbates those issues and causes deleterious effects to the brain, the body, uh, self-worth, self-esteem, academics, career, even IQ, as well as genetic changes that these substances can affect on the body. I have a nonprofit called knowyourneuro.org, and I create videos from for kindergartners all the way up through 12th grade. It's for schools. I've got about uh, 65 school districts in the United States and two schools in the UK that use it. It's a free uh, prevention program. And uh, so I do a lot of uh, podcast interviews. I'm an 
my books too. The, the, the website is based upon my books. I'm an author of the Neuro Whereabouts Guide for Parents and a children's book series called Know Your Neuro Adventures of a Growing Brain.